use Bobby Wayette's art many years ago. And uh, this good guy's been having this for a long time. The ASTM's been going on for a long time. Um, so this should be pretty enlightening. I'd like you to welcome Mr. Douglas Marshall. So I'll talk about ASTM uh, as an organization, a bit about aviation standards. I'll talk specifically about the F-38 committee that uh, I've been involved with and has been involved with aviation or UAS standards for several years. And then the focus on small UAS and then some of the global acceptance challenges for this technology or the standards and the guidance and the uh, specifications out there. ASTM has produced about 12,000 standards in a variety of industries uh, that are out for publication or for use. Everything from uh, standard size and gauges of, of uh, electrical outlet sockets. The first standard that ASTM created was 1898 uh, on the construction or the manufacturing of uh, rails for railroads. A series of incidents of derailments because of Poor construction or poor design of the rails. So that was the first standard that came up with. It goes across borders, across disciplines, uh, across all kinds of manufacturing of materials, uh, medical devices, uh, things like cameras, even in some phases of computers and technology. So it's a constantly evolving effort from uh, the organization to try to stay up with what's going on in the industry and the manufacturing all phases of technology. Uh, depends entirely upon volunteer work. Uh, I put a lot of time into ASTM uh, volunteer. It's something that's available to like, any of you. Uh, part of the ASTM effort is one piece of what Nancy was talking about is the engagement piece of making standards and regulations and specifications work for unmanned aircraft. If you want to be engaged, if you want to have an immediate impact on the future of your business and on the outcome of some of these standards and regulations that are in development, join ASTM and become part of the conversation. All it costs is 75 bucks to join. You can then join pretty much any committee that's on the ASTM, whether it's F38 or other areas of expertise that you might be able to share with your colleagues. <coughs> uh, as I said, we rely upon the expertise of uh, participants and members try to collect people into the work groups and into the standards groups that can bring technical expertise or background through their experience or uh, academic through teaching or development of systems or uh, products that they can bring their experiences to the table and share uh, what they think can be the best standards, the best practice, the best uh, specification of a particular element of uh, what it is to be regulated. Uh, these standards are global, international, the goal is to develop a standards body of what particular uh, technology is being dealt with that applies not just in the U.S. but uh, around the world globally and can be harmonized with in the aviation world, uh, civil aviation authorities anywhere. Are we going backwards here? This is the spectrum of aviation standards and regulations, sort of a, a, a continuum from the left side where a, a 
type of aircraft can be completely exempted from a regulatory oversight and regulatory treatment. So kites and model airplanes, for example, are specifically exempted. As you move to the right, you get uh, the other extreme, which is uh, commercial airlines and commercial aviation, which is heavily regulated, as you know. And in between, you might have a regulation by the NFA recognized third body organization. In this case, the, uh, the example is the United States uh, a hang glider and a parasail and paraglider association. They have their own SOPs, their own processes that they publish internally to those who are involved in that particular activity. Uh, and that's a real light type of, of uh, not so much regulation as, as an adaptation or an endorsement of a particular SOP. You get to the self declarations for the FAA recognized consensus standards, which is where we are with UASs. Uh, the ASTM committee F-37 uh, is also involved in aviation. F-38 is the one that deals with UAS. So F-38, what's that mean? I'm going to talk about the vision, the mission, and the structure of F-38 and how it works. Uh, the focus on the small UAS, uh, a little bit about the history of why we are where we are, and then the harmonizing of the standards going forward. The vision is to provide uh, routine, safe UAS operations in similar space through standardization processes. And standards can be guidance, can be uh, specifications, can be recommended best practices. There's a variety of levels of, of uh, standardization. The mission is to produce a practical, consensus-based standard that facilitates UAS operations at an acceptable level of safety, acceptable to the FAA, and more important to society. What is society willing to accept as a level of risk for introduction of this technology in the national airspace. It's a big mission. It's, it's not the easiest thing to achieve because we don't really know what it means in some cases. It can include uh, design, manufacturing, maintenance, operations of the systems, training and qualifications of personnel. Uh, we support industry, academia, government organizations, and other regulatory bodies. So the structure of F-38 as it is right now, and this is kind of an evolving uh, process because some of these subcommittees have been moved around within the organization, but F-3801 is the airworthiness group. The chair of that group is A.J. Seagal from the Wild Group. Uh, they're dealing with products such as hardware and software, uh, safe designs, construction, tests, and modification and inspection of individual components or parts of the system. 3802 is Mark Blanks, who's the uh, lead on that. He's a junior tech. Uh, they're more oriented towards procedures, operational uh, performance based standards, and safe deployment is really what we should say, instead of the deployment of the system within the aviation community. And 3803 is led by Scott Strip. Uh, Scott is the airline pilot, he's the captain of the A320, captain of the United Airlines. Also, runs a drone business on the side, so he's got feats in both communities. We've been teasing a lot over the last few days over the, uh, the unknown plastic bag that's struck me. You need to certify the plastic bags in the National Airspace. Uh, and Scott's take on that was it was just a little bit of a pilot hysteria that uh, resulted in that report. That's crew oriented safe practices by individuals are responsible for uh, employing or for operating the system. The history of how we got involved with a small UAS effort. Uh, there was a, an art from Bruce and I who uh, participated actually. Bruce Charter was the co chair along with Ted Bergenowski from the Air Environment at the time. Uh, the FAA chartered this ruling committee in April 2008. Uh, the idea was to produce a regulatory system or body that would deal with small and light aircraft, meaning 55 pounds and less, operation within visual line of sight, daytime operations. And, uh, ASTM as an organization was invited to participate in the art deliberations. Uh, there was a lot of people, there was 20 or 25 of us that were on the art, some in that rank, something like that. Again, a broad spectrum of representatives from industry, academia, and government. Uh, April, about a year later, uh, we issued our recommendations to the FAA. It was actually an 11 month plus process. We delivered our product on the day that it was due. 
September of that same year, before taking any action at all on the recommendations, the FAA uh, sent out a request to the standards development organizations, the SDOs, such as ASTM, RGCA, SAE, other standards bodies out there, seeking their input on their ability to uh, actually produce grants regulations, or standards, excuse me. So in April 2010, the FAA and ASTM signed a memorandum of understanding putting basically ASTM in a responsible position to develop these underlying standards that are going to support the part where we set a rule that's still pending at this point. And it was our understanding, I think, as we went down that path and that process, was that we would be supporting the, the new rule, we would have some input as to what that rule was going to stay, uh, although they couldn't share with us the exact language of it because it's still in the process. But we had a fundamental structure of how we were going to approach uh, the standards making process. So from April 2010 through January 2015, uh, ASTM developed, began developing and finished uh, and published a number of small UAS rules, or excuse me, the standards, in support of uh, the anticipated UAS rule. Those standards include design, construction, and testing. The subgroups designed in the, uh, the command and control subsystem. And these numbers you see to the right, the F2910 or F3005, are the work products that came out of those particular subcommittees. Uh, production acceptance, quality assurance, maintenance and continued airworthiness and aircraft flight manual, which is basically a training manual. Those products were all completed. They went through a ballot process, and that's the way STM works, is uh, the committees produce a document in response to the charge. It goes out to the main committee, and then it's voted on through a balloting process. It's consensus-based, so anybody who is an ASTM member, as a member of the F-38 committee, gets an opportunity to review the, the recommended standard and vote on it. I'll come back to it in a minute, but I'm sure that one of the operations of our people we're on our second ballot on the standard that we've, uh, we've been developing over the last three years. And when there's a negative vote from anyone, and a comment that goes along with the negatives, that just like the rulemaking process, that vote and that negative comment has to be adjudicated. And you have to sit down as a group, the ones that developed you know, the standard itself, and address the concerns from the person who's given us the input. Either agree with it and say, yeah, that's, you're right. We'll change the language if necessary, or there's really no impact on what we're trying to do, so you know, no change uh, is recommended. Or we could reject it and say, yeah, we understand what you're saying, but this is why we don't think we need to make a change, and then that, that uh, the language will stay in the, in the, uh, the document. So in February of uh, last year, the FAA issues its NPRA on Part 107, we all had anticipated that all the work that has gone into developing standards to support the rule would be in some way acknowledged or validated by the FAA and the actual rule itself. When they published the rule, there was no statement in the rule about consensus standards at all. It was as if all the work that had gone in in the last in the previous five years is what I'm going on. And we were assured by the FAA leadership that no, that's not the case. But, and there's a reason why we excluded the rule we can't tell you what that reason is because there's an ex party rule. Because the rule is still in development. And to this day, I don't know what the rule was, or the reason it was. Maybe some FAA people in the room might know, but I don't know what it was. So there was a lot of uh, consternation and a lot of conversation within ASTM as to what do we do with this? We've had you know, hundreds, if not thousands of hours of voluntary work and people who really cared about what we were doing, about the outcome. And we don't know whether the FAA is going to be paying attention up with. If there's nothing else out there, there's no other industry that says a standard that would define the best practices of the guidance for these particular categories. Sure, that's okay. Um, so we don't know what the finals of the rule is going to be. It's supposedly going to be out here this next month or the month after that. Perhaps we'll circle back and have an opportunity to look back at our standards that have already gone through the balloting process. Some of them are being looked at again 
because as the standards were being developed, the focus was on fixed rain amino acids, and then the Cambrian explosion revolution of helicopters <laughs> and, uh, and uh, VTOLs came along in the middle of this process. So we've had to go back and look at some of those early standards to, to revise them to accommodate the new technology. Other standards of development are operations over people, the most controversial one right now, probably. Uh, extended and beyond visual line of sight operations, it's in the ballot. They're on their second ballot, we're on the second ballot of operations over people. Uh, operational risk assessment, uh, also in ballot. Adapting algorithm software, dependability. You can see the list here. These are standards that have been developed. They're also in the validating voting process. And so we're going to have to go back and look at it again. I can say um, we've been involved in the operations of the people standard for three years now, which has been a frustrating process because we've had our terms of reference redefined for us three times along the way. That comes from the FAA. So as the rules change, we have to go back and start over again with some deliberations. I know, I'm almost done here. So, bottom line is the ASTM is seeking more uh, participation, more uh, cooperation and support from the community. If you want to be engaged, if you want to make a difference in creating performance based standards or uh, risk based standards, uh, get involved with ASTM because you're actually going to be in, in a position of not making policy, certainly producing standards that will offer a means of compliance to whatever the rules are. It's a really important process. There are other organizations that are doing similar work. Hopefully it's not going to be overlapped with what we're doing at our CCAs. Those are the two contacts. So Paul Delavovitz is the, uh, the membership secretary. Ted Barkowski is the chairman of uh, F38. Ted's in semi-retirement. He actually is retired. He's working full-time with stuff like this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but let's take a little break and come back and we'll finish up.